Good to see you guys. Thank you so much for coming out. Thanks for being here on a Sunday morning. Those of you that are watching right now on YouTube or listen to it on the podcast, thanks for joining us as well. My name is Josh. I'm the lead pastor here at Harbor Church, and we're going to jump in in just a quick second. I want to follow up with what Alyssa said um, on just loving on our, our Harbor Kids volunteers. They make it possible so that parents can have, a, have somebody watching their kids, and we can present uh, the same thing, uh, a message about how we can grow in a relationship with Christ. We can present that to the kids on their level and free the parents up to sit in here without distraction and get poured into as well. That's only, that only happens because there's so many volunteers willing to step up and make that a reality. The reason I bring that up is because they're not the only volunteers that make Harbor Church happen. We're now doing this at five different services, and we're, we're able to impact over a thousand people every weekend because other people inside Harbor Church have stepped up, whether that's to help park cars or to push buttons in the tech booth. Maybe it's opening a door and smiling or pouring a cup of coffee or ha- helping people find seats. You get to see these guys up here singing songs and playing instruments, but there's a lot of other people behind the scenes, whether that is the, like I said, the greeters or the security team or somebody like that. Here's why I bring that up is because our church has grown so fast, so quickly. People come and they're like, man, I love this. I love this church. I love being a part of it. But like, you guys are all set. So I'm just going to sit and consume and not contribute. And I feel like I'm on punked. I feel like there's a hidden camera. And I'm like, you think we're all set? What? Like, if you want to watch a pastor have an aneurysm, just say that to him. I, I don't think you need any more volunteers. No. Um, Here's, what, here's what's going on. God has blessed so much, and his hand, is, his hand of favor has been so good to us. Um, he gave us a, a new building that we are, we are trying to get ready to move into up in the Mashpee Katuit area. That'll be a second location for us. And when we get ready to launch that, now, by the way, we just got our permits to start doing some of the, the work we've been waiting to do on that building. So we are rocking and rolling. You can make some noise for that. Give God a little bit of praise. What that looks like, as soon as that gets done, we got to launch that ready to go fully running with all the volunteers. So there's some people that are currently serving here as volunteers that they are, they're going to call Mashpee Campus their home campus. So they're going to be leaving. That's going to leave a lot of vacancy here. Um, so if you're like, man, I love Hyannis. This is where I want to be. You need to jump in now so that when, when that, that group of people leaves, there isn't this big vacuum and there's not, you know, we don't have, we're not able to keep holding services. Same thing. If you're like, well, I think I'm going to go into Mashpee. That's a, a whole brand new. We would love to have that fully staffed, ready to go. Um, and you have an ability to, to serve and to, to be a part of it. Even if you're kind of new to church and you're like, I don't know what to do. Find a way to, to, to love on or serve your fellow man. That's a great step to take. And if you're sitting here going like, well, you know, I'm really new to this. I've only, I've only been around for a little bit. I used to be an atheist. Cool thing about God is he was preparing you for the time when you weren't because you've been opening doors your entire life. And even those of you that are like, I'm not sure what I believe, you know how to open the door. And if you can smile, that's like icing on the cake. So like, just do something and say, hey, I want to be a part of what God's doing. Um, we'd love to see you jump in and, and serve. And uh, also just be praying because what, what is happening now in the community around us is our community and our state is, is, is in so desperate a need for help. We've got a lot of opportunities. And we just need the manpower. So what I'm praying is that God, as God continues to open these doors for us to step into, to bless other people and to get the gospel out there more, that he's going to bring about us leaders, people that are already sitting in the church that are able to step up and lead new ministries and to start some new ministries and other volunteers who are going to be able to help man that so that we can continue to reach more and more because as soon as we launch Mashpee, I want to get something going down Cape and over the bridges and that's only going to be possible if more and more people step up and say, God, use me. So pre praying about that, that God would supply the leadership and the finances and I believe he'll use the people in this church to do that so we can keep telling more people about Christ. Now, uh, I want to jump into this series because we've got a limited amount of time, and you might be looking at that intro video going, what is this about? I thought, man, let's look at some of the crazy stories from the Bible, and I don't mean that metaphorically. Like, there are so many cool supernatural things in the Bible, so many things that are, uh, I mean, like God moments that you're like, wow, that just blows my mind. I'm not even talking about those. As cool as those are, I'm talking about the times when people truly go insane. Like, you would think, Is there any stories like that or like one or two? I was reading the Bible. I'm like, God, there are so many people who lose their friggin' minds. Like, why is this in scripture? I think God shows us people going through some really difficult mental uh, uh, scenarios and situations because we can learn from it. Uh, And I want us to jump in and we only, I'm only going to do this series for a couple weeks. uh, And and I want to look at some different, uh, different ways that we go crazy and we have some, some tough times there. Uh, And I want to start with a guy who has a seven-year period where he loses his mind. 
And I don't mean like he's like a little bit, I mean, he is like, he's got, he goes completely feral. Holmes like starts eating grass like an animal. He wanders in the fields and the rain comes down on him. This story is found in the book of Daniel. And if you don't remember uh, me talking about Daniel last week, it's a record of the captives. There is a, an empire, there's this, this Babylonian empire that comes into power and they start conquering everybody. And God says in the book of Jeremiah that he's going to allow the Babylonians to conquer the Israelites. He'd been protecting the Israelites and, and, and his chosen people for so long and nobody could really complete, like really conquer them. Well, God pulls his hand of protection away because they walk away from him. They start worshiping other gods. So he says, fine, I'm going to let the Babylonian empire come in and take you guys over. So the Babylonians have victory. Um, they take who they don't kill. They take as captives. They take, uh, I told you last week, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, that's all recorded in the book of Daniel. Daniel's a young man that they take captive who ends up serving the king of the Babylons, uh, Babylonians uh, in Babylon, and that, that's a guy named Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel serves him and rises in rank as one of his trusted advisors. God comes to Daniel and says, listen, King Nebuchadnezzar thinks that he's the reason that he's had so, so, so much success. He thinks he's the reason that he has all this power. I gave it to him, and he's gotten real cocky about it. So tell him I'm going to knock him down some pegs if he doesn't knock it off. This is where we pick up the story in Daniel chapter 4. You should read all of it. I'm just going to start in verse 27. King Nebuchadnezzar, this is Daniel talking. King Nebuchadnezzar, hey boss, listen, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and start doing what's right. Break away from your wicked past and start being merciful to the poor. And maybe, just maybe, perhaps you will continue to prosper. And we'll stop for a second because when we, when we look through Nebuchadnezzar's life and what happens to him, we have to, be, we have to look and say, how, how is God teaching me this? What I see in this, verse, this first part of Nebuchadnezzar's life is that he's doing wrong. And he seems to think that that's okay. He's doing the wrong thing, and he thinks that he can get away with it. And Daniel is saying, if you'll stop, maybe you won't have to encounter the punishment from God. How many times has the man of God stood up and told somebody, you're on the wrong path, and God is giving you time to change your mind, to change your heart? See, when we read these passages about, hey, if you, Nebuchadnezzar, if you knock this off, maybe you don't have to go through all this, all this season of, of of humbling that God's going to take you through we hear it and we go well that doesn't make sense because you tell me that God's unchanging pastor that he's the same yesterday today and forever and he is so then how does how does it how do things change God is always righteous God will always be righteous and just and what that means is he's going to demand that sin be punished sin is evil sin is wrong and if God is really truly just and honest then he punishes what's wrong that is why God's mercy and grace is so beautifully displayed in the fact that he offered up his only begotten son to take our place on the cross. Jesus paid for your sin punishment. Your sin demands punishment. Jesus never sinned, and yet he took the punishment of your sin, of my sin, on himself, and he paid the, he paid the penalty for it. He took up our bill. He paid our bill, the one that we racked up for sin. When God says, things might change when he when nebuchadnezzar he tells nebuchadnezzar change your ways and maybe you won't have to go through this whole season of humbling he's not saying that sin isn't isn't sin what he's saying is is not that he's changing that he's giving the sinner chance to change their heart and you might be in a season where right now he's giving you a little bit of time to change your heart the things you're doing this is what the Galat the bible says in galatians chapter six don't be misled you cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest a decay of death from that sinful nature. When you keep looking out for what makes you happy, when you wake up every morning driven by the desire of what would please me today, you are sowing seeds in your life that lead to that lead to death and decay that's why our marriages don't look healthy that's why our families don't look healthy that's why our workplaces are toxic it's because it's a bunch of selfish people focused only on themselves we get up every day we want what we want we think about what makes us happy and that's how we sow seeds all day long this is about me it's about me it's about me i'm the center of the universe not a single person shook their head yes okay 
Those who live only satisfy their sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature, but those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what's good. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. We're called to do good, and we're called to stop doing bad. And yet most of us believe that because we haven't got caught yet, we can keep doing the, the dumb things that we're doing. Because sin hasn't bit me in the butt yet, I must be getting away with it. Come on, some of you, have, you, you you've crop dusted somebody in the, in the grocery store aisle, and if nobody's there, you're like, I got away with that. And there's nothing worse than getting to the end of the aisle and see somebody turn to come down, and you're like, oh, they are going to know that's me. <laughs> hmm. And... And the reason I bring that up is, one, I love to see the 20% of the room who don't do that, and they're like, that happens? And then they realize they're surrounded by the 80% who's definitely done it. Um, we love to think that we're getting away with something. We love to think that, that like, I'm, I'm the exception to it. See, that's, by the way, that's why some of you are still looking at porn, because your marriage hasn't been ruined yet, so you don't think there's a consequence to it. That's why some of you are still being shady with your sales and your commissions, because you haven't, gotten you haven't gotten fired yet. That's why some of you are still continuing to drown your sorrows with alcohol or other substances, because you haven't wrecked your car yet. You haven't, you haven't royally messed up. There, there's no real consequences, because I've, I've been doing it, and I haven't gotten in trouble yet. I haven't gotten caught yet. I haven't, I haven't paid a price, so I'm doing okay. You see, when we're going to talk about crazy, what you have to understand, insanity, insanity is believing that you can keep doing the wrong thing and getting away with it you keep thinking like oh man i'm getting away with it i will forever get away with it i will be able to keep doing this and it, it it's it's i'm the one i'm i'm the one who can do it the right way i'm the one who's who's justified see i hate people and i hold bitterness in my heart and i know god told me not to but people hurt me and they deserve for me to hate them so i'm i'm the one who can get away with it. no you can't like, it doesn't matter how much you justify the thing you're doing wrong, you, you are going to have to answer for it. And here's the reason that it's so important, is Daniel's telling King Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to have a last time. I don't know if the next time that you do this will be your last time, but eventually you're going to have the last time that you do this. Why don't you make the last time the last time? And he's like, well, why do I have to stop if I don't have any any payment any punishment coming see you'll see this in the next verse all of these things did happen to king nebuchadnezzar verse 28 says it does come to happen to him but look at what verse 29 says it says 12 months later he was taking a walk on the flat roof of the royal palace in babylon let's stop there for a second <coughs> excuse me the bible tells us 12 months for a reason much like my own children we act like if the punishment doesn't happen right away, then maybe there is no punishment. We think maybe, maybe God said that, maybe pastor preached on it, maybe I heard from the word that I am doing a sinful thing, but I'm, I'm, I must not be that bad. God must be preoccupied punishing other people because, man, it's been a year. I've been getting away with it for a year. See, some of you have been flirting with sin and playing with sin. And the Bible says there is pleasure in sin for a season that means the season is running out this is what it says in job chapter 20 verses 4 and 5 don't you realize that from the beginning of time ever since people were first placed on the earth the triumph of the wicked has been short-lived and the joy of the godless has only been temporary why because we have to understand that just because judgment doesn't happen right away doesn't mean it isn't coming I, the reason i'm emphasizing this to you church is because as your pastor i feel burdened that there's some of you that are heading towards a heavy judgment and you don't even realize it and god brought you into this message god has you watching this message right now because he's trying to tell you you're getting ready to get to your last time i'm going to let you do that you've been doing it way too much you know it's wrong and i'm telling you to stop and judgment's coming and you think, well, I've done it a few times. I can do it once more. I don't know when your last time is going to be your last time. But the next time might be the last time. So why don't, we, why don't we just knock it off? Why don't you just right now hear from God and avoid all the mess that Nebuchadnezzar gets himself into? 
Let's, let's go back to it. Let me, let me show you what the Bible says on this, just so you understand your own heart's mindset. Ecclesiastes 8.11, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. See, all the crap in the world that keeps telling you, just follow your heart, you're special and you're amazing and everything you want is just rainbows and sunshine. And if you want it and your heart wants it, then it's gotta be a good thing. That is total bull crap from hell. God says your heart is innately wicked. And the fact that you got away without getting punished for a sin made your heart go, ooh, let's do more of that. And what your heart desires is to keep going closer and closer to sin and keep playing with that until you finally fall all the way off the cliff. And what God's trying to tell you is there's consequences for sin. Even though Jesus Christ paid the punishment for our sin, you could be in this room and be a believer and be saved and still have to reap some of the ramifications of your decisions. Just because you don't have to pay for the punishment of sin, which is, is hell, you might still end up ruining your family with some of the stuff you're doing. You might still ruin somebody else's life. You might still build an addiction that you can't get out of this side of heaven. Why play with things that you, that you know are not God's best for you? He goes on and it says, as he looked out across the city, now remember, it says he's walking around the flat roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and as he looked out, verse 30, across the city, he said, look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. And if I didn't read that with enough emphasis on the right syllables, what you need to understand is this, the book of Daniel is, is one of the only books in the Bible that's not written in uh, Hebrew or Greek. It's written Aramaic. And Daniel, the way he wrote this, the emphasis in this verse is on the I. Look at what I have done. How amazing I am. Said nobody in this room. The, the arrogance here, the pride that he takes. This is why God is going to humble him. Now, some of you just tuned me out. And you're like, oh, it's a message on pride. This isn't for me. I'm so humble. Some of you think that pride and arrogance is about the person who thinks that they're amazing. Pride and arrogance is putting yourself at the center. Do you understand that the person in here, that those of you in here that are whiners and complainers and self-deprecators, you're just as narcissistic as the person who's proud and cocky? Yeah, see, here, here's the thing. The proud in here, look what I've done. Look what I've built. Here, I'm the man. I got it. Look at all the things I've accomplished. Look how great my family is. Look at all the awards I've won. Look how much money I make. Look how much stuff I've built. Look at what I, I'm good, I'm good. And if you're a, a pat yourself on the back pride person, yeah, that's ego, that's pride, that's arrogance. But if you're in here going, oh, I'm the worst and I suck and everything about me is broken and everything I, can't, everything I touch just dies and woe is me, I'm a victim all the time. Blah, blah, blah. You are also arrogant because your narcissism is that you're the center of all the problems. And in both cases, both sides of that are people who think the world revolves around them. I know you didn't like it, but just hang on. All of us are guilty of pride and arrogance, whether it's from a, a mountaintop, look at what I've built, or from a valley, woe is me. As long as we are the center of everything, we are egotistical, we are arrogant. And so what he's saying is, hey, I, I don't appreciate it. Now, by the way, I don't know if your minds work this way, but I see a, I, I picture when I read the Bible, I picture him walking across the palace rooftops and around the balconies, and he's like, I'm so amazing. And then it reminds me of another king who walks around rooftops and balconies and had his fall there too. I remember King David. That's where he sees Bathsheba. Isn't it weird that David never suffers a, a loss on the battlefield? No giant can beat him. Philistines can't beat him. He takes his biggest loss in his palace with his family, with his morals. Nebuchadnezzar takes his biggest loss walking around all he's accomplished. It's almost like God is trying to tell us that even when we're on top of the palace that we have built, that's usually when we're most vulnerable, when we start to stand upon all of our accomplishments, when we start to look at all the things that we have done, when we start to think about how much we are able to build or to affect or to, uh, you know, impact, that's when we're ready to fall. By the way, uh, historians, and, uh, historians and archaeologists have discovered that although other kings built Babylon, it was under ne King Nebuchadnezzar's reign that Babylon really grew to be this like beautiful, beautiful place. He had, uh, it expanded, but they came to find out that it, almost all of it happened because of his wife. <laughs> his wife was the one that was like, I don't like that, move that, pull those pillars down, paint that different, move that over there. And I thought, that sounds about right. <laughs> 
look what I did. Like, dude, your wife fixed it all up, bro. Don't, don't, get, don't get too cocky. But what he's doing there is he's sitting there and he's taking credit for everything that God's allowed to ha- happen in his life. He's, he's taking credit for everything that's good. And this is what the Bible says in, in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit, a cockiness, comes before a fall. It, he's saying, if you want to look at somebody's life and predict what's coming next, look for the cocky person. Look for the haughty person. Look for the person who thinks the world revolves around them, and you could almost lay out a path, and it's got destruction and falls coming. There is going to be a humbling process for that person in their spirit. The more cocky they get, the farther they're going to fall. And it's, it's, some of you would be like, well, I don't, I don't think that's a big deal. You got to you got to understand pride is the original sin. You know why Lucifer got kicked out of heaven? He got cocky. He thought he deserved to be worshiped like God. Do you know why Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit? Well, they must've been really hungry. Hunger was not what motivated them to eat that fruit. They had tons of other food. Well, maybe they're just morbid and evil, and they just wanted to plunge all of humanity into darkness and sin. I don't think so. It was pride. See, Satan was kicked out of heaven because his ego, and he said, hey, I think I know more than God. And then he he looked at humans, and he said, I bet you humans will fall for the same thing. Hey, Adam, hey, Eve, don't you think that you deserve that? Even though God says you don't, you you shouldn't touch that, don't you think you deserve that? And in their hearts, they said, yeah, what I want is more important than what God wants. Do you understand the pride that came out? This is the problem that we have suffered with ever since. The pride of thinking that somehow we we know more. This is is what I want you to understand. When it comes to, I haven't even gotten to Nebuchadnezzar going crazy yet. When it comes to insanity, the insanity of pride is believing is that you start to believe that you're actually smarter than God or better than God or anything more than God. Your plan is better. You're somehow nicer than God. Somehow you're like, well, I know I'm not better than God, but I'm like, I'm living this life. And because my family is the worst or because my job is this or because of that, I'm going to do this. Even though it's not what God wants, I'm going to do what I want because I, I'm just more in it and I know more than God in this particular situation. You may be sitting here like, I'm a church person. I came to church on a Sunday. I'm not like the people you're talking about. Okay, how do you live Monday through Saturday? What's, what's the priority for your life all the rest of the time? You continue to think that the, your desires, your passions, your plan is all that there is. Now you're here, a lot of you, asking God to sprinkle some blessing on top of your plan. Do you know that still makes you the God of your life? You're not surrendered. You're not humble when you're telling God what he has to do for you. I love you, but I'm like all the stuff in this world about like, oh, the Bible and God and Jesus, everything's great. People are using it like he's their own personal genie. As long as I do this, God's got to give me what I want. Who's the center of the universe in that scenario? You are. Nothing about what God has called you to do revolves around you. It's about him as the almighty. When you are the almighty, when you are the end scenario in what you decide to do based on what you think is right, you are not surrendered or humble in front of a God who actually deserves that. See, this is why Proverbs 16, 5 says, the Lord detests the proud. They will surely be punished. See, he looks at that, he smells that in our life, and he goes, man, that reminds me of the Garden of Eden. That looks just like Adam and Eve. I remember that. I don't like that. I don't like it when I see that in, in the hearts of my creation. She's gotten a little arrogant. He's gotten a little too big for his britches, as the saying goes. I'm going to I'm gonna have to make sure that they do not continue to think that the world revolves around them. Daniel chapter 4, verse 31, it goes on. King, King Nebuchadnezzar is walking across the rooftop. Look at what I've created. Look how awesome I am. And while the words were still in his mouth, look how awesome. While they're still in his mouth, A voice called down from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. Oh, Nebi, wake up. You are no longer ruler of this kingdom. While the words were still in his mouth, God wanted to make sure there was no mistake. Yeah, I let you have 12 months to get your life in order, and you kept taking advantage of my mercy and my grace and my patience, but you're about to go through it, and let there be no confusion about why you're going to go through. Are you hearing me? Let there be no confusion about why you're going to go through a period of insanity. 
Let there, not, let there be no mystery about why you are going through a crazy time in your life. I have a plan for you. You have rejected my plan and substituted your own. Do not be surprised or confused why craziness has ensued. Am I preaching to somebody today? The world's going crazy. The world's uh, it's just nuts. Everybody looks like they've lost their mind. Why do you think that is? Because it's, the world is filled with people who are like, this is what I want to do. My desires, my wishes, my, my wants, and my plans are all that matters. And God goes, you are the center of the universe. I'm going to let the craziness that comes from that reign for you then. So he says, hey, this is what's about to happen. You guys know that old saying, your mouth is writing checks that your butt can't cash. Nebby going to figure this out real quick. Jesus talked about this mindset where, we, where our, our, our ego costs us too much. Jesus tells a story about a rich person who starts to build farms, and his, his farms and his crops come in, and he gets so much money that he, he's like, I'll build more barns to hold more crops, and that'll let me buy more stuff, and then I can buy bigger stuff, and I can build more, and I can just, that'll be amazing. And Jesus tells us the story, letting us see this person's perspective. And Jesus says, the guy will sit back, and, and I'll, say to, I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now let's take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. I just described half of your all's life mission. I just want to eat, drink, and be merry. I want to sit back. Because if I can get to retirement, then I know I made it. If my kids turn out okay, and I can, I can just pay off some bills, I'm good. You know that's not what God created you for? Mic check. Do you know that that's not what God created you for? To just make money and make yourself happy? This is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 20. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them, where thieves can break in and steal all of that stuff. Store your treasures up in heaven where moths and rust can't get to them, where thieves can't break in and steal them. Because wherever your treasure is, that's where the desires of your heart will also be. He's saying, I want you to start valuing things that, that you can take with you. You're so wrapped up in the stuff of this world. And all, it, all that stuff will not go with you. It will either get stolen or rust away or be given away or it, 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 it will not go with you and yet you're consumed with the temporary and you're ignoring the eternal. You see, that's insanity. Insanity is putting your hope and your trust in stuff. Now, you might be sitting there going, I'm, I'm poor, Pastor Josh. I don't put a lot of trust in money because I ain't got none. <laughs> But you're putting trust in something. You're trusting yourself. You're trusting your plan. You're trusting your job. That's where you find your identity. Look at my job. Look what I do. Some of you, your, your, your hope, your value system, your identity is found maybe in your family. Getting somebody to love you or having a family. Maybe it's your talents. Maybe it's your good looks or your body. You put so much effort in it. Most of us don't have a reason to be cocky about that. But like some of you... Some of you, you're like, yeah, look what I've done. Look, what, look at who I am. Look at how great I look. Maybe some of you, it's your retirement. It's your future plans. It's whatever. As long as you are putting your hope and, and, and your trust and your value into something other than Jesus, it's an idol. And therefore, it is something that is taking up his spot. And that's why he's saying, hey, that's crazy. Nebuchadnezzar, you've made your value about, you think the value of who you are you think the power of who you are is in this kingdom you've built, in this castle, in this palace that you live in, in this army that you control. He goes, no, no, your best value is finding out that you're a child of mine. The best value, the most important thing that you can have is a relationship with me, and you're cashing in a relationship with me for gold? Somebody going to steal that gold. All of Nebuchadnezzar's gold is not with him now. He didn't take any of it with him. See, this is, why, this is why God continues to speak to him. He goes, hey, your kingdom's been taken away from you. Verse 32, you will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals, and you will eat grass like a cow, Nebuchadnezzar. Seven periods of time, that means seven years, will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. Once again, go read Jeremiah. God said, I will raise up a guy named Nebuchadnezzar. I will let Nebuchadnezzar come in here and have these victories. Nebi didn't read the Bible to understand that everything he had came from God. Almost like some of the people in this room. Everything you have, every dollar, every breath, every heartbeat 
is because God is graciously allowing you to have it. And most of us, myself included, we arrogantly go through every day acting as if God is lucky to have a relationship with us. As if though we're blessing him by maybe going to church this week. Do you understand how backwards that is? He says, hey, this is what's going to happen. I can give that to anybody I choose. And it says, that same hour, the judgment was fulfilled and Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. He ate grass like a cow and he was drenched with the dew of heaven. He lived this way until his hair was as long as eagle feathers. What that means is his hair got so long and matted together, it was just like a bird that like covers himself. You couldn't see where any of the hair separated. He was just so matted, big, nasty dreadlocks. And his nails were long like bird's claws. Our boy Nebuchadnezzar, went crazy literally touched in the head crazy home slice had a feral experience like he's out there he's just out there eating grass making noises reminds me of my six-year-old right now like <laughs> don't eat that don't you eat that it's 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 just can you can you just imagine how humbling that is Nebuchadnezzar is the most powerful man on the planet. There was no army that could stand up to the Babylonians. He was the most powerful man, the richest man on the face of the earth. And now he's out there chewing on acorns. You can't impress people with how great you are when you're in the oh, no, no. Like nobody thinks you're cool at that level. Like think about how nuts he looked. Like you think about Greg from work with all of his conspiracy theories or the fact that like Janet thinks the earth is really flat. Those people look normal compared to Nebuchadnezzar out in the field <laughs> eating grass, making donkey noises. I don't know what he, I don't know if he made noise. I don't know that. I'm mad living that. But like that is a humbling experience to get knocked down that peg. You guys want to go see some, some funny videos of people like uh, getting humbled? Go watch like people who celebrate too early in a race. They have like entire videos of like people who like get cocky, like the football player who like starts celebrating before he gets in the end zone and somebody takes the ball away from him right before he gets in there. Or the guy who, there's a one where like guy's running and he turns around to like mock the guys that he's faster than and he trips and he falls and they run past him. Or there's a guy on a, mo on a bicycle, he's about ready to win the race. So he puts his hands up and another guy goes right, right past him and wins at the end. And I'm like, yes! Yes, your pain is my enjoyment. <laughs> because it's funny to watch other people get humbled. I mean, not me. Like, we don't enjoy us getting humbled, but other people, right? When other people are cocky, they deserve to be humbled. But us and our arrogance, well, it's excusable. We don't think we deserve to be humbled. And yet, Philippians 2, 3 says this, do nothing with, from selfish ambition. Don't do a single thing where you are the focus of why you're doing it. Are you kidding me? When was the last time you didn't do that? He says, don't do anything from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourself. Care about other. Can you imagine how revolutionized our marriages would be if the husbands and wives in this room would wake up tomorrow morning not thinking about what they could do to make them, the, 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 that their spouse could do to make them happy? Because that's how we do. We get out of bed and we're like, I just wish you could put those in the hamper. I just wish you knew how to push, you know, brew on the coffee pot. I just wish you could park your car. I just, oh, man, if, you, if you could just do things, my life would be so much better. So all that speaks to is the fact that we have self-centered mentality. What if tomorrow you woke up and you said, what could I do to make their day better? What could I do to make this? What if children actually cared more about their parents' day than about their own? What if the teenager got up and didn't think, I'm hungry, I want mine, what is my, blah, 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 and actually said, man, what would make my mom's day a little bit better? You know how much this would revolutionize our families? What if you drove out of your neighborhood and instead of looking at your neighbor and you're like, if John would just freaking cut his grass. <laughs> I can't believe Megan painted her shutters that color. Like what if instead of looking at what they do that displeases you, what if you drove past somebody and said, God, let me have the heart for them that you have. What could I do? You put me in this neighborhood for a reason. You put them in this neighborhood for a reason. I might be the only believer for blocks around. What could I do, God, to bless them? Instead of saying, why are they not blessing me? We, should, we could change. And this is this idea of humility. Now, if you want to go look back at the etymology of the word humble or humility, it shares the same root word with another word that we like to eat called hummus. 
Hummus and humility have the same root word where the meaning is from the dirt. Humility, to be humble, means to remember that you come from the dirt. See, Genesis says that in the beginning, God took a big pile of dirt together, and in his, his supernatural power, he breathed into that clump of clay life, and that became humanity. And then it says that when we die, we return back to the dust. And there's something incredibly humbling to remember, I'm dust. See, you can't get super cocky with God, the creator of the cosmos. We're like, yeah, God, this is what's up. This is what I need you to do. And then you go, oh, that's right. I'm a giant pile of walking dust. And in a matter of just a few years, I will go back to dust. And when that, when that really sinks into your brain, you no longer command all the attention or demand all of the service. You instead put your face down and you go, you, God, you deserve everything. I'm just dust. See, that's humility. The story switches narratives, and the next verse, Nebuchadnezzar writes, and Daniel just records what Nebuchadnezzar says, and he says this, after the time had passed, after seven years of living like a feral animal, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven, my sanity returned, and I praised and I worshiped the Most High, and I honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting, and his kingdom is eternal. Do you see the heart change that happens here? Do you see what happens when you're not conformed to this world, but your mind is transformed to follow after the things of God? You might have to go through a seven-year season of crazy to get your priorities right, but when your priorities are right, you start to talk different. Okay, let's stop there for a second then. You didn't seem like that. You want to know how I know that you're not done with your humbling experience? See, some of y'all are like, seven years? Pastor, my crazy season has been longer than seven years. I feel like I've been going nuts for a long time. Sounds like somebody hasn't learned their lesson then. You want to know how I know you're not done going through your humbling season? It's because what he just said was my sanity returned, I looked up, I started praising and worshiping the Most High, the one who lives forever. It's his kingdom, it's his rule. You see, King Nebuchadnezzar was used to having people walk into his throne room, and they would get down on the ground as low as they could, and they would kiss the ground in front of his throne, and then they would say, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, you're so amazing, you're just, oh, no, and they would worship him. And then our boy had to spend seven years down with his face in the mud, <clears throat> eating grass, and then all of a sudden, Maybe I'm not as good as I thought I was. Now, I don't think anybody in here is going to have a seven-year period where you go crazy like an animal. Maybe. I hope not. But I guarantee you, God has got some of you right now going through a season that is designed to get you to look up. But in your arrogance, you keep looking in. Some of you are in the valley and you're, oh, it's all about how bad my life is. It's all about how tough I have it. It's all about the fact that nobody knows how hard it's been for me. Nobody appreciates the trials I'm going. See, it's still about you. It's still about you. Some of you are on the mountaintop, and you're not giving any glory to God. You're taking all the glory for yourself. People come up, and they compliment you on how good you are at business, and you take it, and you're like, yeah, that's right. I figured. Some people come up and they tell you, oh man, your family is so great, your kids are so well behaved, and you're like, yeah, I parent unlike any other parent on the planet. <laughs> See, when you take a compliment and you let it stop with you, you've robbed God of the glory that he rightfully deserves. I know that sounds weird, just hang on. See, everything that God's given you, every breath you have, every penny you have, every ounce of talent, all of your time, all your talent, all your treasure, all your testimony, everything belongs to him. When you start to hoard for yourself, what you're doing is you're allowing yourself to become a bucket, and you weren't supposed to be a bucket. You're supposed to be a funnel. So when people tell you that you, you, you've done something great, that they admire you for something, you pass that on to God, and you say, hey, you think I'm a great parent? Let me tell you about my heavenly father who allows me to do the things that are good about my family. I learned from following after God's plan. The things that are successful in my life are because God created me and has blessed me. I am not good. God is good, and if you see a blessing in my life, it's from him. And and you keep pointing back to him. But see what you and I do when somebody tells us that we're good, we're like, well, stop. 
I mean, you know. Because we love it. We love compliments. But deep down what that does is that feeds that seed of pride that it is about us. Because I am smarter than most people. I am better than most people, right? And we get all that, right? And we start to feel that way. And this is what God's saying. He's saying, hey, no, no, no. I want you to change your mind. Go back to the story. We'll finish. All the people, this is still Nebuchadnezzar's praise. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven, among the people of the earth. No one can stop him. No one can say to him, what do you mean by doing? Nobody can challenge the God of the universe. When you, in your arrogance, challenge God, God, what are you doing? Do you have a clue what you're doing? He's saying, you're not humble. If you're going through a season of crazy and your question is, God, you are wrong. God, you don't know what you're doing. God, this is bad. When you challenge God, you have not been humble. You are still thinking that your view is the best. That doesn't mean you have it figured out. But you have to go from, God, you're wrong. Why are you doing this? To, God, I don't understand why you're doing it, but I know you're right. You see the difference? I may not understand in either scenario, but as long as I think I'm right and he's wrong... I haven't been humbled, and I need to keep going through that season. But when I reach sanity, he says, my sanity returned. I looked up. I actually acknowledged. See, understanding that God is in control, that is a sign of sanity. You are not sane as long as you think you're in control. As long as you hold up to the illusion that you are somehow making everything happen, that if you just, see, I'm trying to set some of you free. Some of you are so bound up and so filled with stress. It doesn't hang on you. When you allow everything to point to God, when you screw up, you get to say, hey, that's because I'm, I'm messed up. I'm not perfect, but he is. Don't build your life on me. Build your life on him. And you don't have to take the weight of everything else. When my sanity returned, verse 36, when my sanity returned to me, so did my honor and my glory and my kingdom. See, Nebuchadnezzar got back his throne. My advisors, the nobles, they sought me out. I was restored as the head of my kingdom with even greater honor than before. And now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and I glorify and I honor myself. Oh, no. See see how things change? You ever get around somebody that every chance they get, they praise and they honor and they glorify themselves here's the secret here's what i figured out here's the formula he goes hey i honor the king of heaven all his acts are just and true and he is able to humble the proud you want to know how i know you're not done going through your humbling season what he just said there god is just in humbling me it was right that god put me through this see most people they think they've reached spiritual maturity because they say Oh, it's a tough season, but I learn from it. You know, see, real, real humility, real maturity says, I needed to go through that. Most people who've gone through a hard time resent the hard time. Like, I didn't deserve that, but I made the best of it. You deserved it. I don't like to think that, right? I don't like to think that anything bad that's ever happened to me is my own fault. I want to think it's everybody else's fault. I want to think it's because, and yeah, the world is broken. So yeah, let's blame everybody else. But see, I'm really humble when I say God was just, it was just that I had to walk through that valley. Don't just tell me that you learned from the valley. Tell me that you realized that the cocky version of you on the mountaintop would never have learned unless you went through the valley. See, now when I learn that about the valleys, I stop resenting the valleys. I stop panicking about the valleys and I go, Mountaintop Josh doesn't learn well. Valley Josh learns well. So Josh needs more valleys than mountaintops. Josh only wants mountaintops. But I learn more in valleys. So now I say God's just in putting me through the valley. Do you also see that he said, when I looked up to heaven, my sanity returned and I praised and I worshiped. I praised and I worshiped. You see, offering praise is a sign of sanity. To the reason that we sang those worship songs at the beginning is to recalibrate your heart that, hey, even if I'm going through it, I am going to put my hope in God. He is the way maker. Even though I don't see it, I know that there's a a work in progress. Even though I don't understand it, I believe he's doing something. That's where I'm going to put my hope and my trust. Psalms 116 verse 12 says it this way, what can I offer the Lord for all he's done for me? 
Pastor Josh, I'm not Nebuchadnezzar. I don't have palaces and gold. I, I, I can't have the same story. You know what Nebuchadnezzar had besides gross dreadlocks and some spinach in his teeth? At the time he gained his sanity, the only thing he had left was to offer praise. That's why the next verse says, what can I offer the Lord for all he's done for me? I will lift up a cup of salvation, and I will lift up the cup of salvation and praise the Lord's name for saving me. Every single one of us, every single one of us, every single one of us can offer up praise right now. We are all capable of that. Whether we choose to or not, that's between you and God. But you're able to offer up praise even now, even in the middle of a crazy season. Even in the middle of losing your mind. There is, a, there is the, always the opportunity to turn and praise God. See, James 4.10 says, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. That humility that I'm just dirt. I'm of the dirt. God, you are bigger. You move yourself out of the center of the universe and you put God in it. And when you understand your relationship to God and all of the crap that's happened to you up to this point was not because God hated you, it's because he was trying to prepare you to have a better view of who he is. And when your view of him is healthy, the rest of your life starts on an upward healthy trajectory. But as long as your view of him is that he's a side character in your story, that he's a genie that grants wishes when you do enough good stuff, you, you don't understand God. The most sane thing you can do is to position yourself at the feet of Jesus. Mary learned this when Martha was freaking out. Peter learned this when it came to trying to fight for Jesus or be close to Jesus. David learned this when Saul was chasing. The best thing you can do is draw close to God. Here's what I'm going to invite you to do. I want you to stand up with me. Proverbs 22, 4 says the true, that true humility and fear of the Lord is what leads to riches, honor, and long life. See, we all want the long life. We want the riches and the honor. And we think that serving God comes after that. The Bible says it's actually reverse. You put your life in, tr in, in alignment with God, and then those things follow. Well, Pastor Josh, how do I do that today? I hear this message, and I guess the point that you're trying to make is be less cocky. I guess I'll try to be less cocky. No, that's not what I'm asking you to do. That's not what Jesus was talking about either. He's saying change the way you view things. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, he said something incredibly profound. He said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, and then these things will be added to you. I memorized it in the King James. The, the New Living Translation says, if you, put, if you seek the kingdom of God first and you live righteously, God will give you everything you need. I'm so worried about all the things I need and I want that I, I put his kingdom way down the list. But see, if today, if I recalibrate my heart and I say, God, I'm going to stop putting me first, I'm going to put you first, then God will bless my marriage, God will bless my children, God will bless my work, God will bless my friendships, God will bless where I go, and he'll, he'll tell me the path that you have is not right, here's the path. You want your retirement to go well? Do what I've called you to do. You want to find real joy? Stop counting on those things to make you happy. Do the things I've called you to do. And see, when I recalibrate and I put him first, now I've found the humility that I need, and now I don't have to go through as many valleys. But the choice, it's up to you. Would you bow your head? Would you close your eyes? I'll pray out loud. I want to invite you, wherever you're at, in the overflow room, watching online, listening to on the podcast, wherever you are right now, would you just pray? Would you just have a moment between you and God where you say, God, I need you. Lord, forgive me for the sin that I've been living in that I thought I was getting away with. God, you poked my heart today. I know I shouldn't be doing that, and I think I can get away with it, but you're telling me today that I cannot. So God, I repent. Forgive me. Help me never to do that again. Help me to walk in the other direction. God, give me some, some victory in that. Lord, I need you. Maybe your, your prayer today is, God, I, there has to be less of me and more of you. I'm so arrogant. I'm so egotistical. I'm so narcissistic. God, forgive me for thinking that things revolve around me when you are the center. Lord, I pray that you would be the most important thing in my life. Help me, God, to recalibrate my priorities. God, today I'm making a choice to seek you first and what you want. Lord, help me. There's so many people praying all over the place, but there's some of you that the prayer that you need is to find the humility to truly surrender for the first time. 
There's some of you, you've sit and you've listened to this entire message and you've missed out on the humility that God is requiring from you to surrender to him. You are still the God of your life. There's some of you that are listening and you have never allowed Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. You're still calling the shots. It's still your plan. In this moment, would you simply have the surrendered heart, the humility to say, God, I'm not good enough. Right now, right where you're at, just pray that. God, I'm sorry. God, forgive me. I can't fix me, but I believe you can fix me. I believe that you paid for my sins for the stuff I've done wrong. Only you can forgive me. Lord, would you take that from me? God, please sit in the driver's seat of my life. You call the shots. You're in control of my life, not me. Everything that I have, my time, my talent, my treasure, my testimony, it all belongs to you. Lord, I I give it to you. Save me. It doesn't have to be those exact words, but it needs to be that spirit. If you'll do that, not only will God forgive you, but you'll have a home in heaven one day when you die. I'll pray for you, but I can't do it for you. You have to have that conversation between you and God. So as I pray, you pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you. Thank you for the story of Nebuchadnezzar. God, thank you for the mercy and the grace and the patience you give to us. We so often misuse that. God, help us. Help us be better. Help us draw to you. God, be with the person who right now needs to receive you as their Savior for the very first time. Lord, would you use this room filled with people? Would you use the the men and women, the boys and girls that are under the sound of my voice right now? Would you use us as we surrender to you, as we humble ourselves before you and your plan? Would you use us to impact our families, to change our, our homes and our environments, our workplaces and our schools and our neighborhoods? God, would you use us as as we leave here, would you make us look more like you and less like ourselves so that more people would come to know Jesus? God, we believe this is the hope that the world desperately needs, a world that feels like it's gone crazy. God, we know that they need you, so would you use us in any way to point people to you? We ask and we pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.